Hey guys, it's Drake here again. And um, this is a remake video of another video I made a couple years ago, I think, about two years ago, on uh, Bottom's Dream. Uh, I think Bottom's Dream is one of the most interesting books that's been published recently, and we're lucky enough to have an English translation, even if it is hard to come by now. So I thought it would be interesting in case people were curious about what it looks like and didn't want to watch my god-awful video that's dark and hard to see. I thought I'd record another version of it, and then I have some extra materials here that go along with it that I think will fit together nicely. So this video is going to be me talking about Bottom's Dream first, and then I'll connect it to Finnegan's Wake, and then I have a couple other Arno Schmidt works, The School for Atheists, and then I have this Evening Edged in Gold. Um, and then Arno Schmidt uh, picture biography. So we're going to start here with Bottom's Dream. So as you guys know, probably it's uh, published around 1970 originally in the German. And it was even a little bit bigger than this, I think, in the German. It's uh, about 1,500 pages. And uh, John E. Woods translated it. He was the guy who's, I think, probably most known for translating Thomas Mann, but he also translated all of Arno Schmidt that Dahlke put out. And, of course, the title Bottom's Dream comes from William Shakespeare, Midsummer Night's Dream. I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream past the wit of man to say what a dream it was. Man is but an ass if he go about to expound this dream. He thought I was... There is no man can tell what. So. Book one, the horror field or the language of Salal. And then as we see here, we have an idiosyncratic construction of the page. We have the center column, which is the main narrative of the book. And then on the left-hand side, we have uh, references that go along with the page. And then on the right-hand side, we have other references. And there's a drawing here. Some of the pages have drawings, but interestingly enough, this, this first part is very reminiscent of The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. Um, It has to be a connection because uh, actually I was reading this whenever I was reading The Fairy Queen in school. I was taking a class on The Fairy Queen and I recognized it. And I asked the teacher if she had heard of this book and of course not, but uh, yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah, the, the left-hand side information is generally related to Edgar Allan Poe. And then the right-hand side are just other uh, connections or references or whatever. So the main like kind of plot of the book is uh, there's a main character who is translating Edgar Allan Poe into German. <clears throat> and Arno Schmidt actually did have a friend who was translating Edgar Allan Poe into German. He was also a translator of Ulysses by James Joyce. So um, they got along well, but you know, as you can see here, this is a polylingual novel. You know, we have, even, even in English, you know, you have uh, the world of cows plus galaxy, la vaca, la cabra, y la oveja nos dan su leche. Um, and then, yeah, Spencer, Edmund Spencer. As you go through, it has multiple other languages. And uh, to continue with the plot a little bit, uh, this character who's translating Poe has a friend come over with his wife and his daughter. It's like uh, 
teen age daughter and then they spend time at the main character's house and they have conversations and talk about poe and about much more than that of the plot is hard to say takes place over uh i've heard different analysis of this but i think it's uh seven days is the most uh, reasonable one I've heard, but um, it's kind of hard to work it out exactly. Interestingly enough, too, you know, even though this book is so long, you know, 1,500 pages, uh, Arno Schmidt didn't recommend reading the whole thing straight, I think, and at least not explicitly. He mentioned to one of his friends that they should just read what's interesting to them. I think he mentioned, like, the first, fourth, and seventh chapters or something like that. I, I can't remember the exact uh, quote, but it was something like that where, you know, just, I'll oh, read this here, read this, and those are the best ones. You don't have to read everything, which I thought was kind of funny. A little bit of the background of how he wrote this. Uh, actually, I can show you some of that in this picture biography here, but he amassed a box, like imagine a box on the ground here, and then you have little notes in cards lined up, kind of like, a, what would it be? You know, like they used to have a Rolodex type thing where, you know, you just have cards and it might be uh, arranged in a certain, maybe alphabetical or whatever, arranged by subject. That's how he did it. And he just had these boxes with cards all lined up, front to back, lined up, lined up. And then after he arranged those from, you know, literary references and magazine clippings and uh, you know dictionary definitions and just anything. He was an absolutely crazy reader. Um, Michael Ordhofer from The Complete Review mentions that he was just an unbelievable reader. You can see that um, little conversation he had with Tyler Cohen online. But yeah, once he did that, then he wrote the book actually pretty quickly. I think it only took him a couple years once he got all the notes arranged, which took uh, I think five, six years, something like that. But yeah, this is the way the whole book goes. And then every once in a while, you know, as you see here, the middle, the middle, uh, like main narrative is no longer on the middle part of the book. It shifts over to the left and then we'll see it shift back. And then as you see on this page here, at some points, the narrative shifts back and forth through the page so it's a very interesting book and unfortunately it's gotten quite rare these days even though I think a lot of people don't really read it but anyway it's interesting to have around if you can manage it I'm hoping they'll have a reprinting of it which I think is unlikely because I read uh, what's his name uh, what's his name? Chad, Chad Post? I think, is, is that what his name is? The guy who was um, working, you know, he, he's the editor for Open Letter Books and he's working with uh, Will, Will Evans from uh, Deep Vellum Books who just uh, acquired Dollar Key Archive. They merged because um, the, the main editor, oh man, my memory's slipping me anyway. This is where I would do a jump cut if I edited my stuff, but um, yeah, I can't believe I can't remember this. But anyway, the main guy who does Dalky Archive just passed away recently. And um, so uh, the guy was going through the warehouse in Illinois. I think it's outside of normal Illinois where they had a bunch of Dalkey Archive books in a warehouse. And apparently they had multiple copies of Bottom's Dreams. Some of them had been like uh, burrowed into by rats or mice or something, but then some of them were apparently still salvageable. So I don't know what they're gonna end up doing with that. But apparently also um, Dalkey took a big monetary hit probably from publishing Bottom's Dreams. So it's, I think it's probably unlikely it's going to happen again, but it's hard to say. At least if it does happen again, they'll probably have to increase the price on it. But I did want to bring to attention, as I did in my first video on this, 
the section of Finnegan's Wake that this kind of inspired by. So close to the middle point of the book, we have the section Finnegan's Wake that splits into a similar idea where the middle narrative, you have the middle narrative and then on the left and right sides you have uh, paratext. And then of course, <laughs> footnotes. So I just thought that was neat to bring out that connection there between Finnegan's Wake and Bottom's Dream, which is very obvious if you read Finnegan's Wake. It's obvious that Bottom's Dream is inspired by it, and uh, Arno Schmidt actually wrote several essays that you can get about Joyce. And uh, actually, this publisher, if you actually want to read Arno Schmidt, apart from Dalkey Archive, this publisher, Green Integer, they're a good publisher to watch out for because they actually keep his stuff in print. Like this School for Atheists, I thought it would be nice to show because if you don't have a lot of money or a lot of time to waste or spend, um, this book can actually be had for a reasonable price and it's not too long as far as his really idiosyncratic works. This is the School for Atheists. I thought I'd show that just a little bit. So it doesn't have quite the same format here, but it does still have his interesting use of language. So I thought I'd just show a little bit of this so that if you are interested in Bottom Stream but can't afford it or can't find a copy, you might uh, pick up a copy of this School for Atheists, a novella comedy in six acts. So there's that. And then this here is uh, Evening Edged in Gold, which I currently have borrowed from my library. And uh, it's definitely the hardest to find, I think, because it came out in the 80s. It was also translated by uh, Johnny Woods. And... Um, this one's even bigger than Bottom's Dream, as you can see, even bigger. And uh, it has a similar craziness to it. Oh, that's kind of neat. Materials gathered, three years, written for less than a year, and then translated by Johnny Woods. 77 to 79. That's even amazing translating it all in two years. The first day. And you see the swimming hole by Kloppendorf. A balling of color on green. You are everything to me because I love you exclusively. So you have the same experimental language and then things are blacked out and boxes here and anyway just wanted to show a little bit of this too because this one's pretty hard to come by and I think uh, you know I think they're going for around a thousand dollars now which is just unbelievable it's really indefensible they should just print another one at that point but anyway, yeah, so I wanted to show a little bit of that one. And then also wanted to show this uh, biography, which is picture biography, which is something that I hope catches on in the English speaking world, because I also have a picture biography of uh, Robert Musil and it's just awesome. I just love these, getting to see what the author looked like and how they lived their life and you know childhood photos and pictures of manuscripts uh, different things like that where they lived when they wrote their books what they're uh, especially for Arno Schmidt it's especially valuable to see what his method was for writing so I'm just gonna turn through this a little bit so that's him that's Arno but yeah, it's, it's all in German, so 
which unfortunately I can't read yet, but let's see. So can you pick out which one is little Arno? <laughs> Are there any other good pictures early on here? No, I don't think so. I think they get better as we go on. So, so there are a couple of his manuscripts. Or in summer 1942, it's Arno Schmidt. So that's before he really wrote much. He was in the German military, which he did not enjoy. There's another photo of him there. And um, yeah, he met his wife actually at work. She was a very smart lady. They would play chess together. That's such a nice photo there. <laughs> Barely cracking a smile. Classic Arno. And uh, so anyway, those are some of his war photos. But he actually was uh, very uh, conversant in English because whenever the war ended, his whole library was confiscated and he had, he, he was lucky enough to be um, under the control of the British, I believe, at least his books were. So he wrote to them in English and he requested a specific book on uh, like measuring the earth, which is, Pretty odd. You wouldn't necessarily think that. Oh, and there's Leviathan. That's his first novel that was put out. 1950, I believe. Um, or 1949, maybe. It says 1949 right there. But yeah, and anyway, he tried to request this one specific book from his confiscated library, and they were not able to give it to him. So he lost all of his books. I can't imagine how I would get past that, let alone having to go through a damn war. Brands Haid, that's his subsequent novel. And then I'll skip ahead here so that there's one of his more famous photos. I think this one's available online. Skip ahead a little bit to his Bottom's Dream Days. Let's see. Uh, must be further. Sorry, I didn't mark the pages beforehand. Picture of his library. What's his desk? He would, oh yeah, look, some gardening. <laughs> of course, he had cats. <laughs> uh, let's see, it must have been further. Yeah. Fortunately, I didn't mark the pages before I, oh yeah, there we go, Zettelstrom. He had a pretty wealthy friend that helped him live oh yeah there we go that's what i was looking for see that's his box with arranged notes as you can see there you might be able to read some of it cryptography oh sorry the fans on so you see notes here um, cryptography volcano diddling pen some of those i'm reading it through my phone so it's kind of hard to see but yeah anyway very idiosyncratic way to write a novel Definitely never been done before, but just gives you an idea of the meticulousness 
that he brought to it. He's living in Bargfeld, which is a very small town, him and his wife. As you can see here, he has all of his notes arranged, going through them, organizing them. I'm sitting at his desk. That's in 65, so. Anyway, thought that would be nice to see his typewriter. Just to get a little glimpse into his life. And uh, also I thought this video would be nice because I kind of had all my Arno Schmidt stuff spread around into random videos. And I know I title my videos kind of in a silly way where you can't really tell what the video is. So this might help as far as people in the future uh, being able to find it easier. Um, maybe if they do reprint Bottom Stream, you can see what it's like from this video and it might help you decide if you want it. But anyway, yeah, if I ever get around to reading the whole damn thing, I'll talk about it. But I can't imagine that's likely anytime soon. Who knows, though? Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this. Let me know if you've read it or if you have it and what you think about it. And for those of you who are like me about two years ago, School for Atheists, and then all of his other books can be had by Dalkey Archive. Novo Daddy's Children, his collected novels, collected novellas, and then the same publisher, Green Integer, also publishes two small collections of his radio dialogues, which was a popular thing in Germany in his time. So, well, hope you enjoyed it. Death is a gang, boss.